It is that time again. Welcome to the four to five. Eric, Chad, and Lauren with you today. Hey, we are everybody. we're on the back end of that week, you know. We are we are kind of gliding toward Friday. Oh. Thanks for watching us on air, online, Firestick, Roku, and the News Two app. Hey, I bet you didn't know that we're actually on Facebook yep. live. live right now. So slide into the comments and say something to us. Well, guys, as you know, summer is slipping away. So you know what that means. It's almost time to head back to school. Guilford County students are heading back to class August 29th, and GCS says they have the staff to welcome them. WFNY News 2's Avery Powell heard from the acting superintendent today about what families should expect for the school year. GCS Acting Superintendent Dr. Whitney Oakley says they're ready to welcome students back. While districts across the country continue to deal with teacher shortages, GCS says they are prepared. Since June, of 20, since June 28th, the district has hired nearly 200 teachers to get more teachers in the door. GCS has been offering a $10,000 sign-on bonus for some positions. There are currently 37 vacancies, but Dr. Oakley said they've learned how to manage because of the pandemic. But it's important to remember that we've been through this, right? I think during the Omicron period, we had to do coverage. We had to leverage our licensed staff. We have substitutes, retirees, and um, other licensed central office staff who are ready to stand in if needed as we start the school year. 2022-23 budget also included some teacher salary increases as well. The district says they are also doing better on bus driver vacancies. We'll tell you more about how many they need and what changes you could see coming up at 5. Avery, thanks. A Guilford County High School is in for a first day surprise. Thanks to a recent fundraiser, Northwest High School is getting some much needed upgrades. WFNY News 2's Jill and Gilkey found out what's in store for students. These mobile units at Northwest Guilford High School, they needed a much needed upgrade. And thanks to some private donations, they got new floors, a fresh coat of paint, new plumbing, and even new roofing. But some units, they got even more new desk, including projectors and even flat screens. Plus, teachers got some brand new supplies. This effort was nearly a year in the making. Last October, the school's parent teacher association, they put their heads together to improve their children's experience. So from October to May, it was all about fundraising and locking in those partnerships. And then we began at the beginning of June. As soon as the teachers and students were done, they were able to pack up their belongings. We kicked off June 6th. All of this was made possible with the help of hundreds of local businesses and private donations. We're probably about 95% finished. What we have left is desk assemblies, some little knick-knacky punch list type things. In all, the Northwest Guild for PTA, they raised close to half wow. a million dollars for this project. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of hard work to raise that much money through fundraising. I know that that is needed because that part of the county is growing so fast mm -hmm. they can hardly keep up with the numbers of students that they see on the increase. And it's incredible how <coughs> much a, like a new desk can just help improve morale. I mean, you know, like going into a classroom, especially some of these mobile units at some some schools, not that one specifically, but I mean, they just kind of look run down sometimes from the outside. If you go in and you got some new desks and just some new things, you c it can make you feel better. Yeah. Nice to get a desk with no chewing gum underneath it. That's, <laughs> that is true. That's, that's what they want. That's no fun at all. And it was just so interesting to hear the PTA, they were telling me that, you know, the bond for the uh, Gifford County Schools, you know, there's plans for renovations, but they want to take this into their own hands because they wanted their children to be able to get the proper experience that they felt was necessary. Absolutely, but soon uh, you'll see more Greensboro police officers patrolling certain parts of the city. Operation School Watch kicks off later this month. The program focuses on the safety of students and faculty as they return for the new year. It runs from August 29th to September 9th. Plus, we're helping students and teachers start the year right with our Tools for School Drive. You can donate newly purchased supplies at specific Walmart stores. We'll also have a one-day supply drive at the Walmart on Battleground Avenue on August 24th. The supply drive runs through September 5th. Watching the skies, most of the shower activity we're seeing right now has been isolated back to the north and to the west. Could see it anywhere, though. Some of you have seen a little 
kind of a sprinkle, some drizzle here or there uh, so far today, and nothing major. We'll take that. Temperatures cooperating as well, 82 in Greensboro, 81 Reedsville and High Point. If you look back to the west, Wilkesboro, upper 70s at 79, Mount Airy, 78, Walnut Cove at 79. Reedsville, you're at 81. All right, tonight, 64 degrees. You can see a couple of storms, again, more likely north and west, but we can't rule it out anywhere. Otherwise, partly cloudy. Tomorrow, kind of the same story, and uh, we're seeing those temperatures now starting to go on the increase. Not so much tomorrow. I mean, we're looking at that 79 degree high tomorrow, but after that, we'll be in the low 80s heading into the majority of next week, which is a little bit below normal. Here's where the rain is right now. You can see it stretching from Mount Airy over to Wilkesboro, all this kind of drifting to the east. So if you're long I-77 or if you have to travel uh, south and I-77 out of Surrey County, you're probably going to run into a couple of showers here maybe an isolated thunderstorm. So far, we're lucky most of the activity has been well to our south from the central parts of South Carolina and on down toward Florida. Uh, here's our seven day for you for the next seven. We look at six or 79 rather tomorrow. It's a decent chance of rain though for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's between a 40 and 60%. That's for the entire weekend, but uh, highs at 82 for Saturday, Sunday. Not a washout, but scattered. And then Monday, a 60% chance and 81. Next week by Tuesday, we're back to normal. Then some low 80s for highs. Tuesday, Wednesday, mid 80s on Thursday and each of those days the normal 20 or 30 percent chance of a shower storm. Time now for your four to five roundup. First up today, a federal judge is considering releasing a partial version of the affidavit used to search former President Trump's home. Prosecutors have one week to submit the parts of the document they want kept secret. They claim the affidavit contains sensitive information about witnesses. Uh, once the judge sees their proposals, he'll, he says that he will decide whether it should be made public. A now former Lexington police officer is accused of giving drugs to a Davidson County Jail inmate. Deputies arrested Felicia Biddix today after they say they were tipped off by suspicious text messages. After intercepting this, we contacted the Lexington PD, did a joint operation in this matter, uh, found out that uh, one of the officers was contacting an inmate and that there was some medication that was uh, brought into the jail without a prescription. Deputies say Biddix gave the inmate two prescription drugs, both considered level four controlled substances. Biddix resigned yesterday and police arrested her today. She is currently out on bond. We've got new details about an inmate accused of attacking two Forsyth County detention officers. Matthew West was in court this morning. He was heavily guarded and wearing a neck brace. He's been charged with two felonies, both are for assault on a detention officer. Both carry a sentence of nearly five years. He's also charged with possessing a weapon by a prisoner accused of making a shank out of a jail property box. Both jail employees have several injuries, including cuts, a concussion and a brain bleed. West was already in jail on a murder charge. He'll be in court next month. Police say they've arrested two people connected to the death of a Wake County Sheriff's deputy. 29 year old Arturo Marin Salido is in jail, accused of killing Deputy Ned Bird. Alder Alfonso Marin was also arrested for his role in this murder. Bird was killed while standing outside of his patrol car last week. Dive teams found a gun yesterday in a river near the crime scene, but haven't said whether it's connected to Bird's death. A grand jury has indicted the daughter of Alamance County Sheriff Terry Johnson. Emily Robinson is charged with death by distribution stemming from an arrest last year. Police say Robinson had fentanyl. Burlington police arrested Robinson last September for possession with intent to sell and deliver. Police said the investigation involved a death. We don't know much more than that, but we will keep you posted. We'll be right back.
The recent death of actress Anne Heche is highlighting the importance of organ donation. The celebrity's organs were donated after she was taken off life support. A nonprofit in North Carolina is on track to have a record breaking year to save and heal more lives than ever through organ and tissue donation. I spoke with a double lung transplant recipient from Stokesdale about her second chance at life. You can see my two girls in the bed with me. <laughs> Julie McCormick enjoys the simple things in life. I love spending time with my family and traveling, um, enjoy vacationing, hiking, um, little bit. <laughs> but in early 2019, the wife and mother of two noticed something happening to her body. I started getting short of breath. Very just doing daily activities around the house. Um, noticed it from walking from my car to my classroom door. I felt like I needed to take a deep breath. That's when she decided to go to the hospital. After several tests, doctors hit her with some unexpected news. Learned that I had a very rare lung disease that affects one in 10 million people, pulmonary venoocclusive disease, and was told that I had less than three months to live without a double lung transplant. What was going through your mind when they told you you had three months to live? Disbelief. Um, I mean, here I am at the time, I was 45 years old, never dreaming that I would need a transplant to live. You know, that I still had kids in high school and um, I had one in college and it was like, wait a minute, I've not got to see any milestones yet. Julie was placed on a transplant waiting list in February of 2019. Two months later, doctors told her they found a match. And it is because of this special lady, Samantha, um, from Clearwater, Florida, that um, I'm here with you today. Nearly three years after a successful transplant surgery, Julie continues to thrive. I have to see my youngest daughter, Faith, graduate from high school. And since my lung transplant, I've seen my oldest daughter graduate from college and now August 6th got married. She even met her donor's family. The mom listened to my lungs and could hear me breathe, and um, she just cried, you know, which is understandable. After the transplant, Julie wanted a way to help others in need of a life-saving organ or tissue donation. She decided to volunteer for Honor Bridge, a federally designed organ procurement organization that serves 77 counties in North Carolina. The organization is on track to have a record-breaking year to save and heal more lives. As of June 30th of this year, 2022, uh, we actually have done 161 organ donors, which is up from the previous year of 143. Assisting others through organizations like Honor Bridge is what helps to keep Julie going year after year. And today I wake up breathing air just like everyone else. I can get up and I can function. So if I can give back in any way, that's what keeps me going. So others have the same opportunity that I've had. In North Carolina, there are more than 3,000 people waiting for the gift of life. Just one organ donor can potentially save up to eight lives. For more information on Honor Bridge or how you can register as an organ donor, just look for the story on our website. We'll be right back. Facebook. Facebook. How's it going, Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> What's new today, it's folks? A new song. What is new? We shot a Panthers promo today. We did. Um, that was fun. Um, I got to play cornhole for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I played fake cards with Julie Luck. And who won? We were playing blackjack. Yeah, we had to pretend like we were tailgating and talk about Panthers on two. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Crazy to think tomorrow is the second home game, or second home game, second preseason game. Second preseason, that's right. And it's on our air. 
I gotta go to the other studio. So long, friends. All right, see you, Eric. So long, farewell. Monique, I just, I just quite, I don't know why I just called you Monique. Yeah, that's my sister from another mister. Okay, um, what's new with you today? Uh, what's new with me today? You know, I just did that uh, donate, organ donation story, so I was really happy about that. As we know, organ donation is very important. That was um, probably very emotional to do that interview. It was, it was, but she was so strong, and I asked her, that was one of the questions. I asked her, I was like, you've been through so much, you know, what keeps you motivated to keep telling your story to others and to give back? And she just said, um, you know, she knows what it feels like to be told you only have three months to live and she feels like other people should be able to um, reach major milestones in life like she has. So That's great. Great good. story. All right, Facebook, we will be back. Well, we're talking about a chance of scattered and isolated storms tonight. We're not seeing a whole lot just yet. We're looking at our hour by hour here. Let's get this started for you. And um, basically, as we go throughout the evening, we think we're just going to see a, a scattered shower or thunderstorm, not anything major. I mean, when we talk about this um, going into the evening, it's just it's so isolated that most of you may not see anything at all. You may get a sprinkle and sometimes sprinkles, uh, they actually develop under the radar beam. That's why we say you're flying under the radar. So that's what happens. You can't see it so much on the radar. The ones we can see are tall enough, meaning that they're strong enough that we can get a good picture of them. And that's happening mostly to the north and west. So from Surrey County and Mount Airy, right along I-77, back south and west through Trap Hill community there in Wilkes County, and then North Wilkesboro. So you'll see a couple of those isolated showers or storms. Can't rule them out anywhere, but again, mostly northwest for us. To the south, though, it's a little more unsettled in the deep south, especially when you get back toward Alabama and Mississippi. But southern parts of Georgia and southern South Carolina areas will see more in the way of thunderstorm activity than what we will see. Here's what happens over the next little bit. High pressure moves away. This low lifts to the north. That adds a little more moisture and instability, so our rain chances will go up. Unfortunately, it's just in time for the weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and really into Monday, we have more of, say, a 50 to 60 percent chance of scattered uh, showers than we normally would. But once all that clears out, we're back to a pretty good situation again heading into most of next week. So for tonight, a few storms, otherwise partly cloudy. 64 should be that overnight low. Tomorrow's highs 79 with, again, a few storms here or there. Look at the rain chances, though. That's really the big story here as we see it go 60% Friday. It's a 40% Saturday and a 50% Sunday. By Monday, back to 60% highs in the low 80s. Saturday all the way through Wednesday of next week. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a more normal summertime pattern for us.
The fastest 16-year-old runner in the country lives right here in the triad. Antoine Hughes Jr. attends Parkland High School in Winston-Salem. He earned the title at the AAU Junior Olympics in Greensboro earlier this month. He got first place in the 100-meter dash. Hughes ran a time of 10.48 seconds, just .2 seconds ahead of second place. His coach is his dad, Antoine Sr. What he did last week was, was definitely amazing. Um, you know, he won the 15-16 uh, uh, 100 meter dash at the AAU Junior Olympic Games. And um, like I said, that's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, I, I went into race knowing that I was going to win because I just, I've been, I set that goal that I was going to win. Oh, Antoine Jr. says his goal is to go D1 in college, then head to the pros. And, and I think he will. I Definitely, 16 <laughs> hitting numbers speed. like that, I can only imagine where he's going to go next. I don't know what the... In feet, what is 100 meters? We need to look that. Right. Because I'm just sitting here thinking about, I know what it looks like, but 10 point, what did it say? 10.4 seconds? Was that right? Something yeah. like that. Something. Something. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Very, very quick. I ran a track in middle school and some of high school, and you're talking about some stiff competition. Oh, and you're yeah. competing against kids from all over. So this is, this is really huge that he won that title. It's not like just doing well at your school. Yeah. yeah this is more of a regional thing. Mm -hmm. And imagine um, the pressure that you feel, <clears throat> you know, to do well, but then to have your dad as the coach. <laughs> yeah. But but he looks like he's not under that much pressure. He was so chill and like, yeah, I, okay. I knew I, I was going to win. <laughs> no, he had a great attitude about it. Um, yeah, so I, I can't wait to see what his future holds. I know. Holds. Yeah. We'll be keeping an eye on him for sure. Well, from one sport to another, we are just about 24 hours from the Panthers' second preseason game. The Panthers play the Patriots up in Foxborough tomorrow night. It's the 12th time they have played each other in the preseason. Kickoff is set for 7 p.m., and you can watch it right here on WFMY, your official home of the Carolina Panthers. So while I don't get too excited about preseason games, yeah, I'm just it's, it's just... What I like about it is that it means football is back. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's more of just knowing I get to watch a pro football game. On right. Absolutely. This is my so my favorite my sports dead time of the year because I'm not I watch a little golf but not a lot. But from April till August, hmm. it's tough for me because right. I, I'm I'm not much into. I watch a little NASCAR, a little golf, but really not a lot. And then now when this hits, I'm like, oh, thank goodness it's back. I just love all the viewing parties. Like I said, <laughs> I'm excited for the Rotel, the Buffalo Chicken Dip, but really just being able to get together with other people to, to, to watch. That's my favorite part of it all. It's always fun, too, when there's people that cheer for both teams. Both yes. Team. It's funny to I watch I like them. the bicker. Yeah, and, yeah. and then some people part of it. <laughs> are really serious about it. That You know, I've seen a couple arguments yep. break out. <laughs> you have to know, you have to know, read the room, right? Yeah. So I'm Absolutely. not going to mess with him, but I'll talk to him. <laughs> Well, tomorrow's game will mean some programming changes because it's on our air. Wheel of Fortune will now air at 10 p.m., followed by Jeopardy at 10.30. And then you can watch WFMY News 2 at 11 right after that. We'll be right back.
Hey, welcome back to the 4 to 5. If you're not on Facebook with us, you need to be. That's where yes. the party is during mm -hmm. the commercial breaks. We're having a lot of fun over there. Lots of people chatting in the comments. And we're also live on Firestick, Roku, and the WFNY News 2 app. We were just talking about how some people will tell us that we look bigger and <laughs> bigger on TV, smaller in person. Yes. And l just so you know, we all look great. <laughs> it's the TV that may, may add a couple of pounds here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody did ask me once in public, they said, well, everybody always says TV adds weight to you. Why, how is that? I said, cause you're taking a, an image like this out of the camera and you're stretching it to 16 yeah. by nine. And they went, Oh, I said, yeah, take about 10 off of me. Yeah. I always get the, you look much taller on television. Yes. Oh, it's because of that box that you yeah, stand on Yeah, I stand on a box. All. <laughs> all the secrets, secrets are coming out now, right? All right, let's get right to it with your four to five roundup. First up today, abortions after 20 weeks are now illegal in North Carolina. A federal judge reinstated the law yesterday. The ban had been on the books since the 1970s, but hadn't been enforced because of Roe v. Wade. A 2019 court ruling stopped the ban until Roe was overturned. We got reaction from both sides. In every abortion, a baby dies. Uh, and we think that life is sacred and that life should be respected and that every human being should have the dignity of a person of the human race. The conversation around abortion later in pregnancy is often dominated by political rhetoric and misinformation about what actually is happening in these doctor offices. And the truth is, is that these conversations don't actually center on real patient experiences, real family experiences that face these decisions. The new abortion law bans determina termination after 20 weeks, except in certain situations. People experiencing life-threatening medical emergencies are still allowed to terminate after 20 weeks. You may have heard the word viability come up in these abortion discussions. Viability means the ability to survive. The 20 weeks is just before the viability threshold, which health experts say falls between 24 and 28 weeks of pregnancy. Obviously, there are strong feelings on both sides of the abortion debate. Statistics from the CDC show that abortions after 20 weeks are actually pretty rare. In 2019, less than 1% of abortions nationwide were performed after 20 weeks. It's consistent with data from previous years when abortion access was protected at the federal level. Planned Parenthood says the two main reasons people get later abortions is because they've received new medical information or they've faced barriers delaying care. Turning now to growing concern over the rapidly spreading monkeypox virus, the White House response team held a briefing today on how it plans to get more vaccines to communities that need them the most. Hundreds of people lined up for the monkeypox vaccine at this New Jersey clinic. Really scary looking, you know, and um, I couldn't even imagine being able to go to work if that happened to me. The vaccination site runs out of doses every day, but the White House monkeypox response coordinator says more supply is on the way, announcing 1.8 million doses will be available for ordering starting Monday. Jurisdictions that are adopting the intradermal administration of vaccine and have used 90% of their current supply of vaccines will be able to order more doses. In order to stretch supply, the FDA has approved splitting each vial of vaccine into five doses to be injected just under the skin. The CDC now reports more than 13,500 confirmed cases nationwide, with New York and California topping the list of states with most cases. 98% of the cases are occurring in men with a median age of 35. In an effort to reach those most at risk, the White House announced a new pilot program aimed at distributing vaccines at large gatherings geared towards the LGBTQ community. But the CDC director is also urging everyone to take steps to avoid risk of exposure during this outbreak. Temporarily reducing or avoiding behaviors that increase your risk of monkeypox exposure is important, especially between your first and second doses of vaccine. I know it's going to spread like wildfire and uh, it's good that we get protected uh, sooner than later. Health officials also say next week they will boost the supply of a drug that can be used to treat monkeypox infections, making 50,000 courses of T-pox available where outbreaks are most severe. 
There's a noticeable increase in one of our local COVID numbers. This graph shows the number of COVID patients in Guilford County hospitals. The latest number here at the end is 79. It's the second highest number the county has reported since mid February. The highest number was the day before at 82. Consider each of these chunks here separate weeks since the gaps are weekends when the county doesn't report this data. Well, this week's numbers have been higher than last week's. It's unfortunate considering last week's numbers were noticed simply lower than the week prior. The way we fight off COVID has changed drastically since the start of the pandemic. The CDC updated guidance last week, no longer suggesting social distancing. It also says masking without quarantine is good enough if you've been exposed, regardless of your vaccine status. However, if you test positive, the five day isolation rule is the same. But is it enough? Our Megan Malaris explains. So let's verify, is it true you can leave isolation five days after a COVID infection begins? Our sources for this are Dr. Chris Uhl, infectious diseases physician with Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and a Boston University study, all confirming it's true. If you um, have uh, symptoms of COVID-19 or asymptomatic COVID-19 and test positive, uh, your isolation period can be over at the end of five days. But he noted the conditions specified in the CDC's March 2022 guidance. Regardless of vaccine status, if you test positive for COVID, stay home at least five days and isolate from others in your home. Wear a mask if you do encounter others at home. End isolation at least five days after symptom onset if you're fever free at least 24 hours without medication. If you did not have symptoms and isolation at least five full days after your first positive test. The caveat is that after that five days of isolation, when you're in public in indoor spaces, you should wear a mask uh, because there is a small chance you could still shed virus. The Boston University study researched 92 vaccinated COVID positive patients with mild breakthrough infections. After day five of symptom onset, 17% still tested positive. But by day 10, the probability of COVID contagion was almost zero. Take note, this study accounted for Delta and Omicron, not their new variants like the BA strains. These variants are somewhat more contagious than the original Omicron variant, but fortunately aren't any more severe. So we verified yes, in most cases you can leave isolation five days after COVID symptoms start or five days after your first positive test. However, masking through day 10 is crucial when out in public, especially inside, in case you're still contagious. That said, while the CDC's isolation guidance didn't change with the latest update, it clarified this. If your COVID-19 symptoms worsen after you end isolation, restart your isolation day at zero and call your doctor. Is it just me or I, I feel like I'm noticing more people wearing masks in public now. I think we went through a really, you know, mm -hmm. when our numbers were so low. Right. But I guess now people are because our numbers are not low. Correct. Right. And I think that I wonder if it has to do with uh, people who are just, you know, they're like, I'm just going to wear a mask always now. Uh huh. And that's just how it's going to be. I know people like that. There's people in my family that wear one wherever they go. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I was getting a little comfortable, but after seeing the numbers start to go up, I always keep one on hand, either in my purse or in my car. So if I run into the store, I can, you know, throw it on. If I'm going somewhere where I know there's going to be a lot of people and I don't know those people, you know, I always have one on standby. I had a friend who said that he doesn't wear it day to day, but if he's going to like um, a restaurant where there, it's not open air. Uh -huh. or if he's going to, he went to a concert recently and he said about 50% of people had the mask. Yeah, on. it's always a 50 50 thing. Like yeah. when I go out, you'll see half people wearing masks, half not. So sometimes I wonder how effective that is when that happens. I don't know. I'm curious to see how employers are going to evolve for this too. I mean, are we going to start seeing employers who are now adding COVID days to sick banks? Ooh, I hope so. Because, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, if you get COVID, it's probably not your fault. Uh -huh. And you have to use all these days of vacation days or sick days. I'm curious to see whether some businesses will be doing that because if you think about it on the flip side, if you have to use vacation days, you're not going to be some people are not going to test or if they do test, no, they might right. not say anything because they don't want to have to miss out on those PTO days. So I, I really friends, hope that that is something that happens going forward. I do too. And I have friends on both sides of that. I know people who said, you know, if I have cold symptoms, I, 
I'm just going to roll with it. And then the, this is literally two of my neighbors that live across the street. And the other one was like, you can't do that. Like it was, right. so I saw that, that polarization. It'll be nice if maybe in a few years, this might be wishful thinking. Like when you walk through a door, it can just go COVID, COVID, or <laughs> they can don't scan have COVID. You. Yeah, so it can just scan you. So you know, like whether they're going to a can building you imagine or not. I don't know, work. maybe. <laughs> You're like, I didn't know what was okay, happening. Okay, see, I'm headed home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Got to go. Just don't take those vacation days. That's right, all, yeah. That's do not that do matters. that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about our forecast. Let's get to this. Um, you know, rain chances, not so much today, but really once we get into Friday, Saturday, Sunday, unfortunately, maybe even into Monday, we're looking at some decent showers. Uh, and the chances there, 40 to 60, 30 to 40 is normal for us in the summertime. But once you get a 40 and up, that's when it becomes a little more widely scattered. We're at 82 degrees right now. Boone's at 73, beautiful, comfortable there. Asheville 75 at the coast. Wilmington and Myrtle Beach at 82 and 80 degrees. And hour by hour for us as we head into the evening, look for those temperatures to get into those lower 70s. We think around that 8 o'clock hour, if not a little bit earlier, and then dropping into the upper 60s by 1 or 2 in the morning. The overnight low forecasted at 64 for tonight. Most of the shower activity north and west. We're seeing some in Danville. In fact, probably Danville area seeing the heaviest rain. Still some scattered left in the uh, northwest community. So mountains and foothills, Surrey County, Wilkes County getting some light showers. And we've had some in the heart of the triad as, as well. It's just been really light, more drizzle or mist kind of situation. The heavier activities to the south, that's because that's where the low pressure is. That's lifting to the north and that's why our rain chances go on the increase for our Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It takes it a few days to get out of here. But once it does so, we get back to a more normal pattern, but it may take us until around Tuesday of next week for that to happen. Here's what it looks like tonight. Just to recap, 64 that low, a few uh, storms, otherwise partly cloudy. The high tomorrow, upper 70s, not bad, still below, well below normal for us. Partly sunny with a few storms for your Friday. Let's go with a good 60 to 40% chance. That's Friday, Saturday, a 50-50 shot on Sunday. Highs in the low 80s at 82 this weekend. Your Monday has a high of 81, but with a 60% chance of widely scattered showers. And then we're back to normal that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sunny to partly cloudy during the day, highs around 83 to 84 and a 30% chance of a late day pop up shower. The chance for storms is causing several local high schools to move tomorrow night's football games to tonight. We've got a running list on WFMYNews2.com. You can see which games have been rescheduled by clicking on the sports tab. And in case you missed it in our Friday football fever game of the week, it is Dudley at Page. More than 8,000 people voted in our online poll, and this game got nearly half of the votes. Kickoff is at 630, and we will have highlights along with live coverage through all of our newscasts tomorrow. Exciting time of year. I know, Jalen, you're excited. Oh, yeah, it's the best time of year. There's nothing better than a Friday night under the lights. Got the, the fans packing the stadium. Mm -hmm. Got the, the guys on the field going at it, just doing whatever they love. It's just... It's, it's a match. It's, it's just like a yeah. too. It's, just it's so a, pure, right? It is. That's, that's right. So it's, uh, I think somebody should call it. It's when the game is a game yeah. and it's not about money and uh -huh. it's not about anything else, you know. And there's great weather for it, too. This week has been Minus absolutely the rain. And yeah, yeah, minus the rain, but it's been pretty good weather. <laughs> has it been a big list of, of uh, teams? Yeah, we've had quite a few yeah. games moved up to either today. We had a couple bump back to Saturday. We do have a strong list of games still mm -hmm. set for tomorrow, so we'll see how it goes. Hopefully we can get all the action in and we'll have it for you here. I don't know about you guys, but for me, I, and Chad and I grew up in small towns, so high school, the high school football game was the highlight. Absolutely. But I could not wait as I was a kid, and it was as much socialization as it was anything. Absolutely. Don't you remember? I remember when we were little, we would throw, I, mean, I say we were probably 8, 9, 10. The big deal was we'd throw football behind the bleachers. We weren't yep. even watching behind the game. Absolutely, <laughs> the right. game. And that's where you go flirt, you know. That's and right. That's you know, right. get the concession stands and all that. One yeah. thing I'm surprised about, though, is, you know, because the, the state required pushing back the school year. I'm kind of surprised that the Athletic Association didn't push back the season. Delay the game. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. now we've got two games even before school starts. Yeah, and so That's the thing with that is though, the state playoff in usually is right around Thanksgiving every year. So we got weather that mm. plays into that and then you don't want to bleed over into basketball and the winter sports as well got because it. a lot of the kids, mm. they play multiple Both, sports, yeah. sports. So, you know, we don't have everybody have a fair opportunity to be able to participate in all. Nothing like concession stands at football games. Hot yeah. dogs, popcorn, yes. football, <laughs> legs, <laughs> all the regulars. <laughs> all Absolutely. The regulars. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back.
During the pandemic, hard seltzers saw a huge increase in popularity, but now there is something new on tap. Check out the latest adult beverage craze and tell us what you think about it in the comments. Apple pay anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Eddie Muchamel manages Village Market and Liquors in Los Angeles and says business boomed in 2020. During the pandemic, everything was selling like crazy. With bars and restaurants closed, Americans drank more at home, and sales of hard seltzer skyrocketed, even when people started socializing again. Like if I go to a party, it's usually Trulies and White Claws and then maybe some beers, but those are definitely the dominant drink of choice. Dozens of new hard seltzer brands have popped up in the past couple of years, but after a huge rise, sales are now starting to fizzle, down 10% this year. There's always a um, product life cycle. John Berg with Nielsen IQ says while seltzers remain very popular, another drink is taking up space at stores. Those shoppers that had been uh, trying hard seltzers are now trying the uh, cocktails. Canned cocktails contain spirits like vodka or whiskey, where hard seltzers are malt-based like beer. Sales for the ready-to-drink products are taking off, up 55% this year. We were really ready for this canned cocktail moment. Sam Calagione is the founder of Dogfish Head Brewery, which started as a beer company but has extended into canned cocktails. Dogfish is owned by Boston Beer. The company known for Sam Adams also makes the popular hard seltzer Truly. And now Truly is branching out. We've already announced that we're going to come out with a line of Truly vodka seltzers. So kind of playing in this interesting white space between what was a traditional seltzer and sort of a vodka soda uh, cocktail. Canned cocktails are creating buzz, but analysts say trends can shift as tastes change. Five. <laughs> we got called talking. We, we were gabbing away about this. All right, so I asked you on social media to tell us about your favorite adult beverage. I got comments all over the spectrum here. I mean, <laughs> you name it, I got. All right, so Claire said, Orchard Thieves Hard Cider. It's from mm -hmm. Ireland. You can't even get it in the States. Then why'd you tell me about it, Claire? No, right. <laughs> she, she loves it there. Uh, Deborah says, um, Miller Lite, no explanation needed, LOL. Sandy said, uh, Southern Comfort and Diet Sprite. I'd never heard of that. Diet Started drinking Sprite. that in high school. She said, it's been my go-to ever since. Billy said, Midnight Moon Watermelon in a can, ready to drink. I guess that's pre-made there. And Josh had my favorite bourbon because it works. That's what he said. <laughs> Wait, go back to the Diet Sprite? That's what and she, she started said. drinking it in, in high school. school. That's, what that's an adult up. beverage? No, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's a mixed drink. Oh, Southern Southern Comfort with and Diet Sprite. Okay. <laughs> Soco, as it's called. Yeah, which that uh, Mr. Party? I, I mean, I, I love a good seltzer. Um, okay. But I also like, they were talking about these canned cocktails, and um, High Noons is, is one of the, I've it is that. the most okay. popular canned cocktail because it has actual vodka in it. The thing about North Carolina law, though, is if it has actual liquor, like the High Noon, you can only buy it at ABC stores. Right. Oh. So you're not going to be able to see it at the gas station or the grocery store. So yep. if they do increase in popularity, they can only be sold at but ABC stores. But that's what's going on the increase is cocktails in a can. Right. That's what that's what is like the new thing now. I'm more of a wine drinker. I like a nice Chardonnay so or wine. a Pinot Grigio <laughs> or something like that. And I like the, the wine you can get in the can too. Yeah. I'll take that to like a cookout or something. Eric, this is you. I'm, this is not really my area of expertise. So I, so I'm, I like the, I don't know what the history behind mm -hmm. cocktails. Like I like to go to a really nice restaurant. And I want the bartender to tell me, you know, show me something different and tell mm -hmm. me why. And some bartenders, the really good ones, know the story of the drink, which oh, okay. I think okay. that history kind of thing really interests me. I love that. Yeah. Um, so Tim Buckley said on our chat, I'll take one of each. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby Odom said, I agree. Me too. He's in. Bobby's in. Yeah. So I don't, you know drink much, um, but if I do, it's either going to be champagne or straight tequila. Ooh, nothing nothing I in like between. Champagne. I so like, I like is, champagne. But that are yeah. both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, exactly, you know. <laughs> it's only, I got two speeds. <laughs> <laughs> I got 10 miles an hour and six uh, racetrack. <laughs> are any of you all good at making your own drinks? I know yeah, you're like yeah, a mixologist. That's, that's my, that's my thing. Nope, not at all. I'm no. good at drinking them. I'm not good at making them. Yeah. Tell them about your tiki bar. Oh, yeah. Well, but that's not really where I do the, like, the good cocktail. That's just for fun. Oh, no, okay. I so where do you do the good cocktail? In my house. I'll, okay. I'll, do, I'll make those there. When, the, when there are no other guests. <laughs> okay. So we, we get the yeah. not so real cocktail. That's when the cheap Chilton comes out. Uh, I'll be making those. Bud Light for, for every everybody. <laughs> everybody. That's right. All y'all come over for that. But for the others, now the Tiki Bar is this thing that we, we built. It's 
Um, it's six feet across and then two three foot sections. They all break apart on mm -hmm. wheels and they roll into my garage. Because my wife said, I said, I want to do a tiki bar. She said, no, you're not going to build a tiki bar. I said, what if it's mobile and we keep it in the garage? She said, all right, now you're talking. Okay. So we did that. We roll it out. It's got a drop cord to it. Plug it in. It's cool. I've been waiting on my peanut. I've been you waiting on my invite. Years. You said, <laughs> yeah, sure. isn't there this like, like, oh, I thought you'd see nope, it. No, never. Sorry, well, this I want this definite. watermelon drink that you've been talking about. Yeah, that's a watermelon martini made with actual watermelon juice. We could just do so on location, good. like a four to five yes. on location. I'm down for it. Our producer just said, she said, ooh. Let's ask the boss if she's okay with that. Yeah, we'll come on. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to break. We'll be back, maybe. Get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> right. Tim. All right, let's talk about a forecast that shows uh, some increased rain chances once we get into that, especially that uh, Friday through Sunday time. I know not when you want to hear that, but that's the truth. We have to tell you what's going on. About a 40 to 60 percent chance of widely scattered showers. Um, looking at a temperature right now of 82 in the Triad, Charlotte's at 83. Coastal sections pretty similar there because we've got enough cloud cover, but 82 in Wilmington and 80 in Myrtle Beach. Hour by hour tonight, as we mentioned, probably getting down to those lower 70s in that 8 to 9 o'clock time period. And of course, my remote control doesn't want to work. Let me step over here and get this going. There you go. Um, low 70s by 8 to 9. We'll probably see some overnight lows eventually by tomorrow morning in the mid 60s. Couple of showers here or there. Danville with a was a heavier shower. Now it's down to more of a moderate style and we're seeing a little bit. It's kind of scattered all across the mountain and foothill communities from North Wilkesboro up through Mount Airy, King and Martinsville with a little bit of rain. Heavier activity is well to our south. That's because that's where the low pressure is located. All that kind of shifts to the north, taking its time, by the way, so that helps to spread moisture over the region. That's why we bring those rain chances up. It may stay with us that low through most of the weekend, and then we're thinking, hopefully, at least by 
Tuesday of next week, we get back to a more normal situation. So just recapping for tonight, you'll have a few storms, maybe otherwise partly cloudy and 64. Tomorrow's high temperature at 79. Long range, low 80s through your weekend. Better rain chances, not a washout, but a scattered shower or two. Next week, low to mid 80s throughout most of the week. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Mike check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hi there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hello, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you hear me? Mic check, one, two, three, three, two, one, one, two, three, three, two, one. Mic check, mic check, 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 check. We're 11 days from the start of the school year. Lauren Coleman, WFM1. Me, mic check, mic check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mic check, mic check, mic check. Hi there. Sorry, I forgot I was doing COVID numbers today. Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada. You've probably seen a lot of news lately about student loan debt. There's been a pause on federal student loan payments since the early days of the pandemic. The pause is supposed to expire at the end of this month, but there's talk it could be extended. There's also a push by some to cancel student loan debt altogether. Let me start out by saying I still owe money on my student loans and have been paying it off for many years. I actually disagree with a blanket cancellation of all student loan debt. There are some people who absolutely deserve it, like the students who we learned this week would be getting loan forgiveness because they went to ITT schools that eventually went under. And there are some people who've been defrauded by the federal government. I'm glad they're able to get some relief. But to cancel all or part of student loans for everyone else seems extreme. When I applied for college and signed on the dotted line on that loan, I knew what I was getting into. I chose to go to the school I went to and I chose to take out a loan to help pay for it. No one forced me. I could have gone to a cheaper school, a community college or a trade school, but I didn't. What kind of message does it send if the federal government just wiped away that debt I racked up? It says I don't have to be responsible for the decisions I make with money and spending. That's a slippery slope. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to eliminate my monthly loan payment of $225, but I was taught at a very young age not to expect a handout. I've worked hard to get to the point where I can pay it off. 
And when I make that very last payment, I will know it was because I accomplished something I put my mind to and settled a 